Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 16 and 17 is where we'll be this morning. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So let's pray this morning and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, it is a blessing to be in church today. Thank you again for that snow outside. We know that your hand's in control of all that. Lord, we just thank you for these folks that have a desire in their heart to come and hear the Bible preached. And Lord, to assemble together and to worship you in spirit and in truth and in song and through, through the preaching of the word of God. And I pray that it would have free course this morning. And Lord, as it's already been spoken in Sunday school, that our hearts would be open and receptive to your word and that your word would be effectual in our lives. Lord, that we would let you move us to where we need to be. And Lord, that we would, we would draw nigh to you and allow you to draw nigh to us. We thank you for that promise and just ask this morning you'll help us to focus on your word. Lord, put out of our mind the things of the world and the things of, of our own desires and our own dreams. Lord, I pray that we would just pay attention, Lord, to what you have for us today. And Lord, we ask you'll bless those of our, our church family that can't be here today. We understand the situation. And Lord, you'll bless them today and give them an extra special uh, love and, and, and blessing in their life. And Lord, that you'll bring us back uh, tonight. Lord, it would be a great time to be, get together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, as we continue right through the book of Ecclesiastes, we're, we're getting sort of towards the end of things here. And, and uh, as we see the, the rest of the, of the chapter 10 is starting to give, a, give us a little bit of, of looking back, maybe a little bit of perspective on a life. And, you know, the Bible, well, the Bible doesn't say this, but it's always been said before that hindsight is twenty twenty, right? And as we, we go through situations, we go through circumstances, and I hope you do this, I hope you look back and you try to analyze that. How did that go? Did I say the right thing? Did I act the right way? Uh, what did I get out of that as, as we just finished being down at Brother Knox's Bible conference? And what a great time, wonderful time to be around the brethren down there and around a church that loves Jesus. Just another good encouragement. Know there's somebody else out there that's working for God. And then and to have those men stand up and preach 12, 13 messages on, on Jesus Christ out of Revelation 1, 4 through 7. It's just a blessing to hear all that. And, and I found myself yesterday as we were clicking off miles through desolate road, as I began to call it. Just straight line, pine trees on the side, three lanes of traffic, nobody else out there. As we were clicking off those miles, my mind was wandering back to what we just heard. And looking back and thinking about what we just heard and meditating upon the Word of God that's been preached and thinking through and, and rehashing conversations that I had with people and, and thinking, you know, did I, did I act the way I should have acted? Did I say what I should have said or... Did I say something I shouldn't have said? And really just sort of analyzing that whole three days, four days. And I think it's good for us to do that every now and then in our own lives. Think back on the last two weeks of your life and analyze it according to the Bible. How have we done? How have I done? And so Solomon here, we're, we're nearing the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. And of course we know the, the context of this book. And I believe that the man is starting to think back in his life. And he's starting to pick up lessons that he's learned and analyzing his life and thinking, boy, this, this is the way it is, or this is how it should have been, or this could have been better if it had been done this way. And you come to verse 16, and it says, Woe unto thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. And then verse 17 says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. And so you have a comparison and a contrast here. And I think if any man could, could sit there and write that, it would be Solomon. Solomon, besides Jesus Christ, and maybe only second to his daddy David, probably one of the greatest kings that ever ruled on the face of this earth. Solomon was a man that, that had uh, the wisdom from God. And if you think back there in, in 1 Kings... Well, we, we, we should go read that this morning, but I'm not going to. Think back there in 1 Kings, when the Queen of Sheba came to visit... Right? She came in, she sat down, she brought all the best of her kingdom. And she got there and she realized, oh, go hide the camels, <laughs> right? go hide the spices. That gold doesn't shine like that gold does. And that is a wonderful picture of a person coming to Jesus Christ. 
The Queen of Sheba thought she was bringing all the great stuff out of her kingdom, and she got to the kingdom of Israel, of Solomon's kingdom, where God had established him. And she looks at it and she says, boy, all my stuff just pales in comparison. And that's a picture of us coming to Jesus, trying to bring all of our righteousnesses, all of our good works, all the best of our life. And we come to him and we look at Jesus and we get a picture of him through the God's holy word. And we say, <laughs> well, that works nothing. Just hide all that stuff. Lord, I need what you've got. And she gave. She gave all that to Solomon. And then he gave back to her. And she made the comment as she was there and she saw his servants. Oh, even, even his servants were, were in line. They had a good heart. They were, they were happy. You can imagine the Queen of Sheba's servants probably weren't too happy if she's taking notice of someone's servants who are happy. And she looks at all that and she, she marvels at how God has set Solomon up. And I think Solomon w- was a great king until he started disobeying God's word. And that's going to be true in my life and in your life. We're going to be good in our life, as long as we follow God's word, but the moment we get off track following God's word, we too, like Solomon, our heart's going to start to turn away from God. We're going to start to say, you know what, coming to church just a drag, singing these songs just a drag. There ain't nobody here. I'm not going to go to church. We start looking at the negative side of life instead of looking at the positive side of our spiritual life because we're happy in the Lord and we're content in his word and we love his word and we're digging in his word. And the things that are to be found in this word are more precious than gold, the Bible says. It's a wonderful book. And if we'll give our lives and give our heart to it, we too will end our lives in joy and in peace and in contentment. But when we start to turn our heart and our mind away from God and focus it on the things of the world and focus it on what I don't have and what I think I need that God says I don't need, we're going to have a big problem. And as Solomon looks back, he says this. He says, woe unto thee, O land. And then verse 17, blessed art thou, O land. So there, there, there's a woe. And there's a blessing. So this morning's message is entitled, Blessings and Woes to a Land. I think as we continue through chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes, there's a somberness, there's a sobriety that's beginning to enter Solomon's tone. And I think you and I can mark it down. Listen, once we've enjoyed the pleasures of sin for a season, and there is pleasure in sin for a season. But in Luke 15, the prodigal son came to himself. That, that young man, boy, you think about that. That young man was given his inheritance that was coming to him before his dad died. He had all the riches. He had all the clothes. He had all the, the four horsepower mules, right? Amen. I mean, he had it all. He had everything. The half of his dad's kingdom, if you will, was given to him. And the Bible says he went and he wasted it. And as he wasted it and he saw those riches decline and he saw that money decline and he, and he was enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, finally the man comes to himself but he's sitting in a pig pit, wallowing with the swine, trying to eat the husks, the trash of the food, and he says, this isn't what I bargained for. And I tell you, every one of us, if we don't get our focus on Jesus Christ, If we get over trying to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, when sin is finished with us, we're going to say, boy, that wasn't worth it. That was a waste. And so the somberness and sobriety begins to enter Solomon's tone. And once he's enjoyed the pleasures of sin, he's come to himself almost. And there's a somberness and a sobriety which has his attention now. He's he's almost arrested by that. He can't focus on anything but the fact that he's made a mistake And it would have been better off if I had served God. That's a good place to come to. Unfortunately, some people don't ever come to that point. They just continue finding the next thing, the next sin, the next pleasure. They don't ever get to the point where they consider God and consider how wonderful he is. There is a day of reckoning coming. We are going to reap what we sow. And for many folks and for many of us in this room, perhaps, it may be regret. It may be shame. But as was preached this week, and, and Brother Jim and I both sort of seem like our minds clicked on these words over in Revelation 1, verse 7, the, the verse ends, even so, amen. 
You and I, as we, as we uh, maybe we, we sow the wrong seeds in life, we sow the wild oat seeds, we sow seeds to sin in our life, and we do that for a season, and we think, well, I didn't get caught, I didn't have to suffer the repercussions of this. One day that harvest is going to grow, and all we're going to be able to say is, even so, amen. Because we had it coming to us. I believe if any man was qualified to make these statements, it was Solomon. Statements are made from observation and experience regarding maturity and leadership. Now this morning as we go through this, we're going to talk about a land, but I want you to consider your own self as being that that quote-unquote kingdom or that land. Because every one of us in here, we have the ability to choose and to make choices. And listen, I know we say we ought to submit ourselves to God, and we should. We ought to, we ought to follow Jesus Christ, and we should. But every one of us is going to make those governing choices every day. When you wake up in the morning and you realize, I'm awake, I'm alive, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Right? And we get up out of that bed and we start governing our life that day. We start making choices. How, what am I going to do today? What am I going to wear? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? What am I going to say? All those, that's the governance of our life. And that's our quote-unquote little kingdom. And so here the Bible says, Woe unto thee, O land, or kingdom, or person, <laughs> when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. That cover photo on the bulletins, ridiculous, isn't it? None of us would put a three-year-old baby into the White House. And I'll hold my comments right there. Just because a man's 60 years old doesn't mean he's mature. Just because someone's six years old doesn't mean they're childish in some ways. You think about in the Bible, you think about this. Joe Ash was seven. That's young. Chloe's what, ten? Gideon's what? Seven. Could you imagine Gideon? <laughs> We'd be better off. Wouldn't we? no, <laughs> right? But no, think about that. Think about that. A young man that age, crowned king. Joash was seven. Josiah was eight. Jehoiakim was eight. Boy, that's, that's young. And here the, the, the warning is, woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. You know, Joe Ash, he did pretty good. He had some adults around him that showed him the way. But as I preached a couple of weeks ago, Joe Ash, once, I think it was, who was it? No, it wasn't Jehoiakim. Who was the high priest then? We can't remember. It's okay. Whoever the high priest was then. The Bible says when that high priest was dead, that he turned and he went 180 degrees away from God. Say, why is that? Well, obviously he never developed his own walk with God. But the bottom bottom line is some of those kings turned out good, some of them didn't. And so the woe to a land is when your king is a child, it's implying immaturity. It has nothing to do with age. We've been studying Saul extensively in 1 Samuel. That man was immature. I don't think he was anywhere near ready to be the king of Israel. And I believe God, I know God chose him, but I believe God chose him so that he would have to rely upon God. And he didn't. He leaned unto his own understanding. He did not acknowledge God in all of his ways, and so therefore God did not direct his paths. So just because a person is, is you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 years old, that doesn't mean, spiritually speaking, that they're mature. It also doesn't mean that someone that's 10, 11, 12 years old can't have some spiritual maturity. And I I, I understand that that has to be put in parentheses and bracketed and qualified. I understand that. But look, there's some some 10, 11, 12 12 year olds that you'll hear them talk about something. Boy, it'll smite your heart. (laughs) Just, Just look, just their childlike faith in God is enough to put some of us to shame. Just their, boy, my little girl, I appreciate it. I was, I was dog tired last night and got home. We've got that little children's book that I gave all these young family, children's Bible. And she came up and she said, Daddy, I want to read that book. I'm going to be real honest with you. I didn't feel like doing it. But I can't deny that to her. And you know what? That, that's a little bit of smiting to my heart. 
that, hey, she wants to do this. She wants to sing, go tell it on the mountain every day. <laughs> That's her song. Daddy, can we sing, go tell on the mountain? And I got to check my heart. I want to say no. And then I think, why not? Right? Why can't we sing that? Let's sing Jesus loves me. Let's sing whatever it is. Right? So, so all I'm saying is this. Maturity has nothing to do with age. It has to do with experience. It has to do with the heart of a person and how it's, how it's submitted to God. And so Solomon says, Woe unto the old land when thy king is a child. It goes on to say this, when, print, when thy princes eat in the morning. And I think we can take that to be this, that eating in the morning, of course we all eat breakfast, right? Amen. Some of us. But princes eating in the morning, when you contrast this with verse 17, look down there and it says, talk, not talking about the king, it says, and thy princes, verse 17, eat in, what's it say? So the contrast here is, well, someone's getting up and they're feasting early in the morning, and then someone else is getting up and they're going to work and they're getting things done, and when they need to eat, when it's time to eat, when it's due season, then they sit down to eat. And keep reading what it says in verse 17. Eat in due season for strength and not for what? In other words, verse 17 is telling you, look, there, there's some people out there that are going to eat because they need to, and then there's some people that are going to eat just because they want to. And so the, the contrast there is the princes in verse 16, they're wasteful. We can infer from verse 17 that they're drunken. We can infer that they're gluttonous, that they're lazy, that they're moochers. And 2 Thessalonians 3.12 Three ten through twelve tells us if a man doesn't eat, or I'm sorry, if a man doesn't work, he ought not eat. That's God's principle. So let's look at this in terms of a nation. When you have an immature leader, and you have a group of people underneath that leader that are able to expend the resources of the people at their desires and for their hearts, their their belly and their heart's desire, and they're just doing it because they want to do it. They're not doing it for help to anybody else. The Bible says. Woe to that nation, America. We're there. We've got spiritual wickedness in high places, but we also have immaturity in leadership positions. We have a a, a country and a government that that takes the resources of the people, taxes the people, and expends it on the most ridiculous things you've ever seen in your life. Our government spends millions, if not billions of dollars a year to promote abortions. Our government spends millions if not billions of dollars a year to, to protect the pet sins of a certain group of people. Our government, <laughs> I gotta watch this, takes millions if not billions of tax dollars from the American public and spends it on saving salamanders. What are they doing? It's whoever's, whoever's in charge is saying, this is what I want done. It has nothing to do with the good of the people of the country. It's their little pet project, and they're going to spend however many millions or billions of dollars to get it done, and it's wasteful. It's unnecessary. They're drunk with the idea of, i got to save the salamander. Because if I don't, the whole ecosystem is going to fall apart. No, it's not. God's got a hold of it. It's, it's okay. <laughs> And listen, I know that, that was a profession that I was in. I know, I know Brother Andrew's got to deal with that sometimes too. Right? Save the sand flies. It's just the way, the way this world goes. It's wasteful. And the Bible says, woe, woe to that land. But now, Christian, how about our lives? Do we have an immature king on the throne? Do we waste things we ought not waste? Does God bless us with all spiritual blessings? Sure he does. Does he feed us every day? More than we ought to eat probably, right? Woe unto us when the child is a king on the throne of our heart and Jesus is not there. Woe unto us when we eat in the morning for drunkenness and for our own pleasure and not of necessity for substance. Woe unto us. It keeps going in verse... 17, and it contrasts and says, Blessed art thou, O land, blessed, when thy king is the son of nobles. That, that son of nobles means there's a kingly line there. 
If you think back to Solomon, who was, who was his daddy? Talk to me. Y'all talk to me. Who was his daddy? Remember what David did? First Chronicles, or Second Chronicles, no, First Chronicles 28. Remember what David did? David made all that preparation to build that temple. David had the architects draw out the plans. And when Solomon stepped onto that throne to get anointed and sworn in on Inauguration Day, if you will, his daddy had trained him. His daddy had prepared for him. That kingdom knew he was coming. Everything was just set up just right for Solomon to step in and keep things moving right on down the line. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? That's a blessing when there's a godly heritage there. David hadn't, he didn't just, didn't just provide for Solomon. He pointed him to God. He said, Solomon, if you'll follow God, he'll bless you. He'll take care of you. But if you don't, he's going he's to curse you. He's going to get after you. I appreciate my mom and dad bringing me to church. <laughs> I appreciate them instilling Christian values and biblical values in me. And if you're here this morning and your mom and dad did that, you ought to thank God for that. And now us that are, that are parents ourselves and got young kids running around, listen, listen, we have got to instill in those kids the things of God. We have got to teach them biblical principles. We've got to teach them godly principles. And not only teach it to them, I've got to live it. And you're going to have to live it. And grandparents are going to have to live it. Right? And aunts and uncles are going to have to live it. And you've got to have a group of people around that's training that child for Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the world's going to get a hold in there. The son of nobles, there was training, there was experience. David had prepared Solomon. He had exhorted Solomon, hey, when you take the throne, you serve God, son. When you take the throne, Solomon, don't you forget about God. When you take the throne, Solomon, follow God, follow his steps. And, and Second Corinthians, or whew, I say that every time. Second Chronicles starts out, things are going good. And you know when God comes to Solomon, it's not because Solomon had any crazy favor with God. It's not because Solomon uh, looked better than anybody else. No, when God came to Solomon, you know what Solomon was doing? He was sacrificing. He was doing the things that Daddy had told him to do. He was doing the things that knew would please God. And when God saw his heart, he said. I'm going to go talk to him. Boy, we need that today in our lives. How, how submitted are we to the word of God? How submitted are we to God's leadership? How submitted and committed, maybe I should say that, how committed are we to Spring City Baptist Church and, and the direction this church is going? How committed are we to this Bible? How committed are we to our Savior? How committed are we? The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You're trying to serve God and trying to please yourself. You will not go anywhere. You'll not move <laughs> in a bad way. You'll get snowed in. Well, we were coming up 26 yesterday through Asheville. And <laughs> why people were out in little two-wheel drive dinky cars, I have no idea. But you go by and there'd be a Prius with four feet of snow piled up on it. And Brother Dan said, that just makes me happy. <laughs> and I get it, right? But if you be like that, you'll be like that car on the side of the road. If you're trying to serve yourself and serve God, and you're not just 100% in for Jesus Christ, you'll be unstable, you will not be able to get any traction in your life, and you're going to have to pull over to the side of the road, and as a snowplow comes through and cleans all the junk off the road for other people that are going somewhere to get there, you're going to get piled up with a whole bunch of headaches and bitterness and anger and guile, and you're going to sit there and rust and rot and, and die. Amen. That's a wonderful message this morning, preacher. Thank you. Glad to have you home. <laughs> who's, on, who's on the throne of your life? Who's on the throne of your heart? Is a child there or is King Jesus there? Because listen, he's the son of sons of nobles. He's got the best lineage of anybody. Is he on the throne of our heart this morning? If he is, there will be blessings that follow. And then look at, continue reading verse 17. It says, and thy kings, the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Th that's some stewardship being shown there. The Bible says it's required of a steward to be found what? Faithful. How are we stewarding the things that God has given us in our life? 
Boy, money makes the world go around, doesn't it? We don't, we don't do it here. Some churches do it. Some churches get an audit every year, every 12 months. And a CPA firm will come in, they'll, they'll audit them, and you know, they'll, they'll look at, we're going to go over the business of our church. Hey, look, when, when, that, when those lumbers go down, you can't change them. They're there. That's what happened. That's a record. Right? How, I, I'm, well, I don't want to ask that. I, I wonder, do, when, when you get ready to do your taxes, do you, do you audit yourself, quote, unquote? Do you look back and, and look at what you spent throughout the year? I think it would be really good for us as Christians if we would run a, a pro, y'all know what a profit and loss sheet is, a P&L sheet. If we would run a P&L sheet on our own lives, I think that'd be really good. We'd probably come out in the red more than in the black. Where did, how much money did you spend doing this? How much money did you spend doing this? How much money did you give to God? How much money did you spend doing this? How, that would be interesting to see. Can we do that? Yeah, she says, yeah, I got a CP accountant wife. She said she'll do that. I'm curious. I, I, would, I would be curious to see that. I think it would shock our pants off. We would say, I spent what on that? And then you look at that in, in regards to, and I know we don't have to give 100% of our income to God, but where our heart is, there will our what be? Our treasure. Where you, I see I switched it on. Yeah, that was good. Y'all got it. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm not saying you've got to give everything to God. I'm just saying this. Does he get the first fruit? Does he get the top? He ought to. He ought to get the best of our money. He ought to get the best of our time. Listen, he ought to get the best of our strength. He ought to get the best of our mental ability. He ought to get all that. And I promise you, if you'll give him that, he'll bless you. Because you're putting him first. It says, when thy princes eat... In due season for strength. For strength. How are we stewarding our lives? How are you spending your time? I sat down with Brother James, and I didn't get a straight answer, so I don't know what to do with this. But I sat down with Brother James. I sat right beside him. I said, Brother James, I said, I want you to tell me, how do you structure your life to where you can write and do all that you do? I just wanted to hear how the man, how he spent his time. And he said, he said, look, it kind of came down to this. He said, he said, when I was in high school, he said, I had a teacher that told me to write 30 minutes every day. And he said, I've never stopped that. You'd be amazed what we could get done with 30 minutes a day. Sit down and focus on something for 30 minutes a day. You'd be amazed. If you would read your Bible for 30 minutes a day, say, oh, I can't do that. Really? 30 minutes? You'd be amazed what it'd do in your life. If you pray for 30 minutes a day, say, preacher, that's an hour. I know. What else are we doing in that time? I've said this for years. I, I, I try to get these kids in these high schools. I say, guys, keep yourself an hour long. When I was an architect, you had to keep your time to the nearest 15 minutes. I said, man, why, why don't you do that? Why don't you keep your time to the nearest 15 minutes, figure out what you're doing, how you're spending your time. And you look at that and say, is that a good use or should I do something else? I tell you, redeem the time. The days are evil. The Lord's coming is nearer today than it was yesterday. He's coming back. How's he going to find us? Is he going to find us faithful? Or are we going to just be expending all the resources that he's given us and all the time and all the blessings? Are we just going to be throwing them at our own desires and our own lusts and be found unfaithful? Where's he going to find us? All right, 1 Corinthians 10. Who's on the throne of your heart this morning? Who's governing your life? Is a child or is Jesus? And not the baby Jesus either. Does Jesus Christ have your heart? Or does a child? Somebody that's immature. 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> and the Bible says this <clears throat> in verse 11. It says, When I was a child, I what as a child? Spake. Says I, what as a child? Understood. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Say, preacher, I don't, I don't, I don't know where I'm at. I, you know, what's the test for my Christian life? The test is this, when a trial comes along, how do you respond to it? 
I'm watching my three and a half year old daughter right now. And boy, boy, I'm telling you, you'll learn a lot of lessons from these kids. I'm watching her, and she tries to do something, and she gets frustrated. And she, she throws it down and stomps off. You know what that's a picture of? Daddy. Hey, look, I can't do that in the church. Can't do that here. It's going to be a big problem if we do that here. Things don't go the way I want it to go. <sighs> Bless God. Can't do that. Can't do that. Can't lose our temper. What's losing your temper? It's a childish thing. Last night, I was playing with her in the hallway. And I had a good, I mean, we played for 30 minutes. <laughs> kicking a ball up and down the hallway. It was simple stuff, right? And I said, Abigail, I said, I said, Dad, I can't do it anymore. I'm tired. I need to sit down. You need to get ready to go to bed. Oh, she lost it. Just, <laughs> right? She didn't get her way, and she melted down. And we know, look, we understand, three and a half years old, she, she, she's got to work on that. But how many adults do that? Don't get our way. Well, pout. Somebody feels sorry for me. I wish we could, anyway, wish we could correct adults the way we correct a three and a half year old. That might get something done, I don't know. How do we respond to things? When something doesn't go right, do, do, we, do, we, do we freak out and call everybody else and, and never one time hit our face before God and say, Lord, what, could you help me here? I hope we don't act childish in our life. And really, if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, what's that whole chapter about anyway? It's about charity. That's some maturity. To have charity. That's a, that's a good phrase for a message, isn't it? Listen, it takes a lot of spiritual maturity to exercise charity. Look what it says. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Thinking about other people. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me what? Nothing. Did you read that? And give my body to be burned. If somebody came in here today and said, and put a gun to your head and said, either denounce Jesus Christ or we're going to tie you to the flagpole outside and light you on fire. So it's extreme. <laughs> Happening all over the world right now. Though I give my body to be burned and have not cheered. What do you think about Stephen? What? Stephen died unnecessarily, didn't he? Why did he die? Because he, he preached the word of God to a group of people that just would not hear. Oh, they hated God. Why? Because they had a child on the throne of their heart. It was King Self. And he's not very mature. Stephen, as they threw the rocks at him. Please, try to put yourself in that position. I'm sure he's on his knees, maybe on his hands and knees. And they're throwing rocks at him. And they're cussing him. And there's hatred. And they're throwing rocks at him. The Bible says he looked up to heaven. And said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Well, that, that's dying with charity. That's giving your body to be burned, but still thinking about the people around him. And then, of course, our ultimate example is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As he hung on that cross naked and ashamed with the sins, not a sinner, but the sins of the whole world imputed on him. And they stuck the spear in his side. And they put the crown of thorns and they buffeted him and they plucked his face. And he hung there and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Boy. That's some, that's some maturity. That's some spiritual maturity. And I know that's an extreme case. But look at what it says at the top of verse 3. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. I believe this has to do with, yeah, you know, you run a soup kitchen, that's fine. You can run a food pantry, that's fine. 
But, you know, just giving someone, meeting someone's physical needs, even though it's a good thing, there's nothing wrong with it. But giving someone their physical means and not, listen, not giving them something that will help them spiritually, I believe is a holding back of charity. And you can disagree with me if you want to. It's fine. I'll still love you. Okay? But, but these churches that have great programs to help the poor, it's all, it's all good. Churches that have soup kitchens, man, it's great. But if you're not giving somebody something spiritual to help them, in that situation, I believe we're missing the mark. Holding back some of that charity. Verse 4, charity suffereth long. <laughs> Patient. Long-suffering. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's some spiritual maturity. Can you suffer long with people? Can you put up with people for a long time? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, right? And when we lose that temper, when we lose that patience with somebody, the child on our heart's coming out just a little bit. It says it in his kind, charity envieth not. I, you know, you ladies that work at nursery dinner, y'all could write a book on this. Those kids, right, everybody's got ample toys in the nursery. And a kid wants, wants what Johnny has or what Susie has. And you go over there, and, and we teach this in the schools too, right, about, about greed and how those kids will jerk that thing away and say, mine. Right? Well, they didn't pay for it. They didn't work for it. It was a gift given to them, right? You know, your life's a gift. What do we do when, when the Lord comes by and says, hey, can, can I use you? Do we say, no, Lord, that's my life. Get away. Or do we say, yeah, sure, Lord, just take me and use me. Whatever you need. Here am I. Send me. A child envies. A child is selfish. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. Do we talk about ourselves more than we should? Well, you get, you got to watch yourself in conversation with somebody. I've got to watch myself. Somebody will be talking about what, what, how God's blessing them, and, and it's just something within us that you feel like, well, well i got to say something like that too because, you know, if I don't, then I'm less of a person. That's not the case at all. And let somebody give God the glory, and glory, glory with them. Praise God with them. And if they ask you, well, what's God doing with your life? Or what have you done in this or that situation? Tell them. But this, this isn't a, a match of who's done the best and who's got the best blessings. And all that mess is childish. People ask me all the time, how many people go to Spring City? I say, as many as God wants to be there. I quit telling them numbers. I'm so sick of it. Because the immediate response coming back is, Oh, that's, that's good, brother. We had 195 there the other day. And then my response is always, well, tweedledee, tweedledum. Who cares, right? We're not comparing churches. Look, the size of the church has nothing to do with the spiritual maturity of that church. It has nothing to do with that. We get childish when we start comparing ourselves among ourselves, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says that's not wise to do. We're not, we're not in a match to see who's the best Christian. The, the whole purpose of our life is to try to match up to Jesus Christ. Let him guide us. Let him direct us. Verse 5, doth not behave itself how? <laughs> That's inappropriately. I forget, I think it was a comedian who said, kids say the darndest things, don't they? Yeah, we, we giggle, we laugh when they say stuff. But you know, if you're 33 years old and you say that, you're about to get punched. People don't take it the same way. People expect their pastor to act a certain way. Pastor expects the people to act a certain way. Right? You're the president of a company, your company expects you to act a certain way. You're a missionary, the church act, expects you to act a certain way. You do this or that, or you're a deacon, or you have a Sunday school class, whatever it is. If you're in a position, there's an expectation there. But if there's a childish king on the throne of our heart, we're going to make a mess out of it. Seeketh not our own. Verse 5, not selfish. Is not easily provoked. That's a lot of that long suffering and patience, right? Meekness. What reading across Moses right now? 
Every time those people came and murmured to Moses, how many of you would have just (laughs) said, forget it? All that God brought those people through in Egypt, all the Red Sea, and they got there in the wilderness, and Moses, we're hungry. Moses, we're thirsty. You know what they were doing? They were following a man. They were not following God. Even though God was in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, they were not following God. And that's why God gave them the law. That's why he gave them the commandments. That's why he put them in front of, between a rock and a hard place, the Red Sea and the, and the Egyptians. That's why he did all of that to prove their heart and to try to show them, hey, look, don't go complain to Moses. Complain to me. <laughs> well, we don't do that, will we? We'll complain to other people all day long and we'll never one time approach God about that thing. What is it? That's childish. There's a, there's a child on the throne. Thinketh no evil. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. The Bible says in Philippians 4 there's some things we ought to think on. Whatsoever things are honest... Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are of good report, what I'll leave out, Brother Greg. True, honest, just, lovely. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And I think the Bible says in James chapter 4, flip over it real quick, James 4. James chapter 4, I think it says this. No, it's not James 4. Where is that? Well, anyway. Well, anyway. Oh, it's Matthew 6. Go to Matthew 6. There it is. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Matthew 6. It says, think no evil. Think no evil. Matthew 6, we love, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that's a proof, that's a promise that you can base your whole life on, that if you'll put God first, you'll put Jesus first, he'll take care of all of your physical needs. If you'll put the spiritual matters in your life a greater priority than the physical matters, God will take care of all your physical needs. He promised that. Verse 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the what? Curious, isn't it? People worry about what's going to happen. What's Obama going to do tomorrow with executive order? Who cares? Who's on the throne of your heart? You know, children worry. My little girl, she's got to know what's going on every five seconds. Daddy, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to sit here and read our Bible this morning. Then what are we going to do? Well, then Daddy's got to work and you're going to go play. Then what are we going to do? Then we're going to have lunch. Then what are we going to do? You're going to play some more. Then what are we going to do? Take a nap. Then what are you going to do? Wake up from your nap. <laughs> Just... Worried about it. Well, if we just, if we just follow Jesus, get our eyes on him, we, we'd forget a whole bunch of this mess down here. I think I gave the example. When we came back from Kiowa Island in, in September, I was out there walking under the moonlight. pitch dark, but moonlight. And if I looked down and saw those waves coming in, I would follow that. I, just, I, I tested myself. I would follow the motion of that wave, and as it went back out, I'd start walking this way. But I noticed if I just look, look out up on the beach straight ahead, or if I look up into the sky at that moon shining, walk just fine. I didn't do this mess. Same is true in our lives as Christians. We get our eyes on all the filth of this world and all the things going on down here. We're going to be swayed by it. We're going to be pushed by every wind that comes through. But if we'll just keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we'll walk straight ahead just fine. Think no evil. Number, verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity. Surely, surely nobody here would, would rejoice the fact that there is a beer brewery on the, on the docket to be approved in Russell County. Sure, nobody would, would rejoice in that. Surely nobody would rejoice when the Supreme Court handed down their opinion about the definition of marriage. Surely nobody in this church would rejoice about that. But the world does. Why do they do that? Because they're childish. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoiceth in the truth. Does the truth of God's word just thrill your heart? I guess not. Does the truth of the Bristol Herald Courier thrill your heart? <laughs> if it's even truth. 
Does Fox News thrill your heart? Or does the Word of God thrill your heart? That's the only thing that's true. That's the only thing that's right. Beareth all things, verse 7. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be, t- be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come and that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child. Boy, isn't that a, isn't that a, a new light on that verse with the context of all that? When I was a child, I spake as a child. How's your conversation? Brother Mark talked about this morning about being moved to speak. And I think it was Isaiah that said the word of God was in him as a flame of fire. And he just had to speak, just had to say something. And there's Paul in chapter 17 in Athens. And he's sitting there. He's waiting on on his guys to come. He's by himself. And he's watching these people come by and bow down to those idols and worship the unknown God. And boy, I can just see him sitting there. And, and he figures out what's going on. And he gets, I'm seeing, you know, you know how we do, right? All right, we sit down. We, we want to be comfortable. All right, we cross that leg and we just kind of sit back and take everything in. I can see him sitting there and he figures out what's going on. And he sort of sits up a little straighter. And he sees what's going on. And his, his feet start twitching. He starts wringing his hands. Finally, he gets up and he says, You men of Athens, I perceive you're too superstitious. The unknown God, him declare I unto you. He couldn't sit there anymore. He had to say something. How about us in our lives? Do we speak as a child or do we speak as a son of God? Now, now that's something to think about. I speak as a child. I understood as a child. We could go through Hebrews chapter 5 and, and contrast the milk and the meat of God's word and what the Lord says is, is milk is the understanding of the, the, the correct doctrine in the word of God. And what's going to be the meat is the outworking of the sound doctrine, our, our lives and our manner of living. And if you haven't read that chapter in Brother Knox's book, I, I encourage you, go read that chapter about sound doctrine. Every one of us need that. It says, I understood as a child. What's your understanding of when the world stock markets are about to collapse, do you... Do you worry about how much money you're going to lose? Or do you say, yep, there's one more step towards that one world government? When you see Christians getting their their heads taken off in the Middle East because they're they're baptized and following Jesus, do you say, oh boy, I hope that doesn't happen in America? Or do you say, even so, come Lord Jesus? (laughs) What's the understanding? Do you understand this life in light of the Bible? Or do we worry about things like a child would? says, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Woe unto thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed are ye, O land, when thy king is a son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Our country is on a wayward course away from God. Don't let that sway you. Our country hates Jesus. Don't let that become you. Our country hates the word of God. Don't let that become you. Let Jesus be on the king of your throne and your heart and you'll be blessed. The saying, it says this, as goes the leader, so goes the country. I think we can change that around and say, as goes the pastor, so goes the church. And then we can drill down even farther and say, as goes your heart, and as goes my heart, so goes our life. Who's leading your life? Is Jesus on the throne, or is there a child there? Let's pray. Lord,